This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1037, recorded on April 18, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody. It's a beautiful day. It's low humidity. The temperature is in the low 80s, high 70s, depending on where you're at. Uh, there are puffy little clouds in the sky. Um, there's no rain. <laughs> We've had some rain. And the temperature is very tolerable indeed. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 73 Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius. And this morning it was 54 degrees. Mm. It's in, been in the 50s last couple of days and it's going to keep being in the 50s overnight. Great sleep. It's amazing there. for August. Indeed. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. <laughs> <laughs> in contrast. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, it's 103. Hmm. Uh, bright blue skies. Bright blue skies. Uh, we are, uh, we haven't seen rain in weeks. Uh, there's uh, really nothing in the forecast. It's going to be 100 degrees for the next two weeks. Uh, maybe a little dip into south of 100. I don't know. Uh, we are seven inches behind in rainfall, okay, which is about, tw uh, means we have about 75% of normal. We are in stage two water restrictions and the lake is bottomed out. So it's just delightful here in Texas. So you can't go rowing anymore? Oh, no, not that lake. The main reservoir, Lake Travis. Okay. Okay. And bottomed out is an exaggeration. However, uh, it's really low. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. It's great to be here. It is 78 Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius here. Um, it's pretty lovely out. Although earlier this week, I was trying to figure out if I had any tickets to the Ark. Um, so I think we are getting all of the rain that Rich is missing out on. Yeah. So, you know, that book I picked a few weeks ago, speaking of the arc, uh, it was thinking fast and slow. So here's another test. They say, tell us if this statement is correct. Moses brought two of each species onto the ark. Not Moses, no. Most people say it's okay because they just focus on the two species. They don't even it's look. It's Noah. Yeah, Noah. it's Noah. But he Noah. explained that. They focus on the two species, plus, you know, Moses and Noah, they have the same syllables. They both sound biblical, that's right? True, so that's people, true, that's true. Most people, that's your that's your system one response, right, Kathy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> did I tell you my Noah Ark joke? No. Um, uh -oh. I think I did. I probably did. <laughs> uh, all the animals are going on two by two, and finally they get to the anteaters, and the anteaters are going up the plank, and they said, Two ants? Two ants? <laughs> <laughs> it's not for you, right? All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, last time someone picked these um, American Innovation coins, and, and I have one from Pennsylvania, and the coin has 1953 polio vaccine. Nice picture of polio virus. Couldn't remember who gave it to me. This is from Les. Thank you, Les, uh, one of our moderators from California. Who, by the way, puts all the timestamps into the videos uh, of TWIV. So uh, he, he goes and listens and he puts the times in. Actually gets them from, uh, I guess he gets them from Jolene and puts them in the, the YouTube. So thank you, Les, for the coin and the timestamps. Sorry, I forgot. Now there's a sticky on the back that will reside there. So <laughs> I will always know who gave it. And uh, if you enjoy what we do here on TWIV and the other podcasts, please give us your financial support. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We and uh, an advertisement for a research assistant position in the laboratory of Amy Rosenfeld at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Review at the FDA to elucidate mechanisms by which cross-species anti-antivirus antibodies may affect virus pathogenesis. 
the research assistant will work on enteroviruses like EVD68 and other and rhinoviruses, genetic, biochemical, and cell-based studies for understanding uh, pathogenesis. So we will put a link to the PDF in the show notes where you have a little more information and you can find uh, Amy's email to find more. Our snippet today is from the New England Journal of Medicine. It is called A Correspondence. And this is, this is like case reports, basically, of people who find interesting things and they write them in. Uh, this one is called Adenovirus-Associated Thrombocytopenia, Thrombosis and VITT, that's Vaccine-Induced Immune Thrombotic Thrombocytopenia, like antibodies. And it's uh, from Theodore Warkington, Jacqueline Baskin-Miller, Allison Raybould, Joanne Shepard, Mercy Daka, Ishak Nazi, and Steve Stefan Mole from McMaster University, University of North Carolina School of Medicine, McMaster University, and Bon Secours Cancer Institute, hmm. which is not in Canada. It's in Richmond, Virginia. Now, Kathy, do you think you could summarize this for us? I will try. So this relates to one of the very rare side effects seen with some of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, the ones that are based on adenoviruses. And we previously did an episode on TWIV, it was 842, where we discussed that the um, three adenovirus-based vaccines, uh, they looked at those actual uh, adenoviruses. And they found that um, these three forms of adenoviruses can interact with a factor called PF4, which is platelet factor 4. And so we have to get into a little of the coagulation uh, uh, system and blood clotting, and it's complicated. But what you need to know about platelet factor 4 is that it's an amino acid protein that's released when platelets are activated, and then it binds with high affinity to heparin. And the major downstream effect of that is that it promotes coagulation. And so the fact that these adenoviruses that were used as vaccine vectors were found to bind to this platelet factor 4 has some implications. Um, namely, the authors kind of speculated that this could induce anti-platelet factor 4 autoantibodies, and they go through a mechanism of that, which for this summary, I'm not going to go into. Okay, so bringing us to today's paper, which is a snippet where not only uh, do we have this previous evidence that vaccine forms of the adenovirus interact with platelet factor 4, but this happens in natural adenovirus infections also. And that was previously not reported, and that's the main finding uh, that's new in this paper. And that uh, also triggers this thrombocytopenia that's similar to what's rarely induced by the vaccine. And suffice it to say that I think this uh, effect of adenovirus infection is pretty rare too. And so then the implication is that that might lead to uh, autoantibodies and uh, complications. And so that leads to some what I call actionable information um, that they kind of give. Remember, this is New England Journal of Medicine, so it's kind of aimed toward clinicians that um, if you have patients with thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, you should also consider um, this anti-platelet factor 4 disorder in your differential diagnosis when you're trying to figure out what might be mm -hmm. causing the thrombocytopenia. And that if that's what you find, then the treatments that have been um, derived or uh, designed for those thrombocytopenias triggered by vaccines could also be useful in those patients, perhaps that got a natural adenovirus infection induced anti PF4. So, <laughs> hey, but, that, uh, by sorry. the way, this paper was sent by Michael Schmidt, who said, "Here's a snippet for you and Kathy." <laughs> Adeno, okay, so we got adenovirus. Yes. I thought you would be right. very excited to have adenovirus. Right. Uh, so, right. uh, Kathy, quickly do uh, do adenoviruses? 
Oh, do adenoviruses? Oh, yeah. the double stranded <laughs> DNA virus, not enveloped, medium sized, uh, cause of a variety of uh, respiratory infections. We have always considered them sort of the minor <laughs> common cold viruses compared to rhinos and uh, coronaviruses. And they can also cause uh, intestinal infections and infections of the eye. And so a, most uh, of us have had adenovirus infections, but most of the time we don't think of them as a serious disease threat. Many serotypes, right? Many serotypes, how, yes. how many are we talking about? Oh, uh, well, at least uh, at least 54, but then there's all kinds of recombinants. So there's a lot of um, Sturm und Drang in the field about <laughs> how do you define them, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, you've already uh, uh, said basically that they cause a spectrum of uh, disease phenotypes from respiratory to GI to um, uh, pink eye. It's mm -hmm. ocular, right. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, are those, uh, this has always confused me a little bit, are those disease phenotypes uh, typically associated with a given serotype or can one serotype cause multiple phenotypes or both? Um, they, they tend to be that certain serotypes are associated with certain phenotypes, but as it is often in science, nothing is all or none. And so um, I, I think you can have multiple phenotypes within one serotype, but there's certain ones that we think of as being the ocular ones and certain ones, the GI ones. And uh, really common infections, right? So yes. chances are you've had not one, but maybe multiple adenovirus infections in your lifetime. Right. Yeah. Um, I think that when people have looked at seropositivity to some um, serotypes, it's very high. Um, so many people have been infected with them. And one of the reasons why people have done those types of experiments is that uh, people also are very excited or have been very excited about using adenoviruses as vaccine vectors um, and ways to deliver uh, DNA um, to a cell. And so, of course, uh, this sort of started out from the fact that people were using them as a vaccine vector for SARS-CoV-2, so the J&J &J vaccine, um, the Oxford Chadox vaccine, um, where the vaccines that were done this way. Right. So is there any connection between adenovirus and adenocarcinoma? Only in the adenovirus gets its name from having uh, been found in adenoids and tonsils, and those are glands. I see. And yes. I think an adenocarcinoma, also the adeno there comes from the root meaning of gland. Right. I, I could be wrong on that, but that's my understanding. So adenovirus, it was first isolated from uh, tissue culture of, uh, is that correct? Yes. Well, <laughs> Um, so we, it was, uh, we may be getting into the weeds here. Yeah. But. Into the weeds, um, <laughs> military recruits with ARD and then, yeah, identified, uh, yeah, from there in outgrowth. I think they, they took out the tonsils and put them in culture. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Was that Bob Chanuk? Uh, that's, uh, certainly right. The right generation. Um, Wally Rowe. <laughs> was also involved. He was definitely involved with mouse adenovirus, but I thought he was involved with a lot with human adenovirus. This is a job for Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Rich. A novel, I'm, I'm hey, look at this. It. Look what I found. A novel adenovirus isolated from the Egyptian fruit bat. Cool. Really? Yeah, everybody has adenovirus, right? Wow. <laughs> Didn't Harry Ginsburg work on that also? He did, yeah. Of course. He did. Yes. Harry Ginsburg. And he was a Michigan graduate, by the way, Kathy. <laughs> And, and not he only played was football he, at Michigan. He did. He not, did. I forget. Okay, okay. He did all of those. He didn't play yeah. football. He didn't go to Michigan. Are you saying he didn't go to Michigan, Kath? I'm pretty sure he didn't go to Michigan, and it, we know he didn't play football at Michigan. <laughs> well, why do you say he, these things, Dixon? Because they're it, embedded in his brain. And my belief system. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Harry uh, was chair of microbiology, and he hired me. So I have. Good memories of Harry. Mm -hmm. And he appointed me as your adjunct professor, so I was happy with him as well. He graduated from Duke in 1937 yeah. and got his MD Duke. at Tulane. Ah. He, he served in the military during World War II, posted in the UK. 
<laughs> he noticed a high incidence of hepatitis in soldiers that had received blood transfusion and concluded that that was the blood causing hepatitis, but he didn't identify the virus. Somebody else did that. Adenoviruses were first discovered in 1953 by Rowe and colleagues. <laughs> the viruses were first isolated from adenoid cell culture, hence the family name adenoviridae. Right. Blah, blah, blah. There you go. And that wasn't even Wikipedia. That was from some Stanford University site. Right. I'm on the same page. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ginsburg demonstrated that adenoviruses normally found in the adenoid <clears throat> tissue were responsible for acute respiratory disease as well as atypical pneumonia and pharyngitis. He showed they could remain dormant, then become infectious. So that's something Kathy mentioned a long time ago, that we really don't understand the persistence, right? Mm -mm. No. We don't. He worked on early proteins, as I recall. <laughs> so one of the reasons well, I bring this up is great. that <laughs> one one of the reasons I bring this up in particular is that since adenovirus infections are so common, and as Kathy's already said, this paper reveals this particular um, problem in a couple of adenovirus infected patients. Uh, one wonders whether the incidence of this uh, in the general population. Now it can't. Uh, the uh, it showed up in the vaccines because it was uh, it, greater than normal. I put into millions right. of people at once, right? And that makes it easy yeah. to pick up stuff, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, but I, you know, you, uh, I wonder whether there's something peculiar about the. Uh, now we're getting ahead of my. I'm getting ahead of things as well. But I, while I'm on it, I wonder if there's something peculiar about. Um, the vaccine or the way it's administered that um, yeah. ex uh, elevates the incidence of this relative to what might happen in a natural adenovirus infection. Well, in fact, that was the speculation in that paper we did on mm -hmm. TWIV was that um, you get, uh, you know, you're injecting these vaccines intramuscularly and so uh, you get a little capillary damage. The, the, the vector, the ad vector enters the blood could complex with platelet factor four, uh, get to the lymph system, and then initiate uh, an autoimmune response uh, against PF4. Whereas, you know, the, the adeno infections are typically not very remic, Kathy. Is that right? I would guess that they're not very remic. So it's but, but I think almost also what you said was that, you know, giving this vaccine to so many people at once with so much yeah. spotlight on them um, would lead you to identify these, where if these happen randomly in adenovirus infections, they're not clustered in space or time. Yeah. It's really hard to pick something like that up. And you don't necessarily know, oh, I had an adenovirus infection three days ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you go in the hospital for Thromb thrombosis and thrombocytopedia. Yeah, yeah, you might. It's just like the, there's a delay. Well, for the vaccination, it was like five days after the vaccine and you hadn't have enough time to generate the autoantibodies, right? So, Kathy, what do they <laughs> treat people who are suffering from this with? Uh, this, this rare condition that we're yeah. going to read about in this paper? Indeed. Well, they they recommend that you could use these same treatments that you use for the vaccine-associated thrombocytopenia, which is uh, anticoagulation, high-dose immune globulin, plasma exchange, and minimizing platelet and fibrinogen transfusions. I see. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about clotting. I went to look it up, and oh my gosh, is it complicated. It's oh, man. <laughs> so many different pathways and arrows and proteins, but basically... <laughs> Kath, um, so Brian, do you teach clotting in any of your classes? I don't, and ah. I often wonder about whether I need to. It's sort of <laughs> been this thing that I've thought about a few times. Sometimes I like touch on the very edge of it, and um, more and more I've been wondering, uh, especially with some of the, there have been some papers that have come out about innate immune responses and their linkage with clotting, mm. um, how macrophages produce certain clotting factors in an inflammatory response. And more and more, I've actually been thinking that maybe I do need to, talk, to teach well, it. Uh, I, I, I know almost nothing about either clotting or 
the compliment cascade, but they strike me as similar themes. Is yeah, that and, right? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I, I do teach the compliment cascade and they are pretty similar. And so I, I have to remind myself when I look at clotting and sort of feel a little intimidated that I, I could understand <laughs> compliment. So I can probably understand that clotting cascade if I tried. Well, if you've cut yourself, you know about clotting because you stop bleeding at some point. It doesn't just keep bleeding. <laughs> And so clotting is an evolutionarily very conserved process to prevent animals with blood from bleeding to death, right? That would not be good because those yeah, animals that didn't have clotting, they are gone millions of years ago. Uh, and there's some parasites that take advantage of that by interfering with the clotting process mm -hmm. to obtain their blood meals, like mm -hmm. leeches, for instance, and hookworm. Well, mosquitoes inject uh, anticoagulants an anticoagulant so that they can take a long blood meal, right? Correct. All right, so clot, you have injury to a blood vessel um, that initiates a, a series of changes in platelets, components of the blood, uh, and eventually leads to cross-linking. Uh, and a protein called fibrin is important for forming the cross-link. These platelets, they're altered structurally. They form a plug, basically, at the site of the injury, and then you have extensive uh, fibers, cross-linked fibers forming that make uh, more of a plug that's strengthening that initial plug. These platelets release a lot of other factors that further activate other platelets. And among those is platelet factor four, which as Kathy said, is a protein. Uh, it's secreted by these platelets. It binds to heparin. And I, I don't know if you said this, but it's, it appears to be neutralizing heparin-like molecules and, and thereby promoting coagulation because heparin is going to antagonize coagulation. So that's the role of PF4, which is the subject of uh, these, these autoantibodies. So you have autoantibodies to PF4, you're going to promote coagulation, right? Uh, and, and I think it's important to also point out there's that role of binding of PF4 to heparin. Right. Um, because in the, the paper, they talk about whether the antibodies bind to the heparin binding site or bind somewhere else. Right. And so do they block interaction with heparin or do they do something else? All right, I just said something that I think is stupid. Wait, antibodies to PF4, what, are, what would they do? I said they promote coagul... They promote... Uh, well, it depends on where they are binding. If they're yeah. binding in the heparin right, binding right. site, then that stops that heparin neutralization. If they bind somewhere else then it doesn't impact necessarily the heparin neutralization. Yeah, so if an antibody to a PF4 cannot allow PF4 to bind heparin, then you're going to have, um, uh, you're not going to have coagulation. You're going to get thrombosis, right? No, that's not right. Thrombosis no. is coagulation. Is coagulation. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you're going to have too much bleeding. Yeah, too much bleeding. Correct, correct. So antibodies that block PF4 attachment to heparin, normally PF4 attachment to heparin would promote coagulation. So if you have, if you prevent that interaction, you are going to inhibit coagulation. You're going to bleed. Correct. But thrombosis is formation of a clot, which is part of the VITT, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had a little correspondence with Daniel. Daniel Griffin, sent, yeah. Yes, and he sent me a review that when I, uh, I will uh, plug the link into the show notes here. Um, but um, let's see here. He says uh, in, uh, in a, there's a nice figure of what they think is going on. Vaccine induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia mm -hmm. antibodies. So these are VITT antibodies are induced that can bind to platelet factor four. We've already said that form immune complexes. So these are, um, you know, multimers, mm -hmm. okay, antibodies, you know, complexes of, that are networks of antibody bound to PF4 and other antibodies. And those immune complexes activate platelets. This leads to pathological activation of clotting cascades and a fall in platelet counts. Got it. And I was confused because it struck me that um got it thrombocytopenia is less platelets the platelet yeah. fall was sort of um uh, didn't make sense in terms of having a lot of clotting because if you 
your platelets drop, you ought to bleed. Seems they're being used be. up. No, they're being used exactly. up to form clots. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Right. And, and the immune complexes themselves also are occluding blood vessels and causing problems with blood flow. And in um, kidney, kidney function too, right? Yeah. I, I mean, complexes can cause a lot of issues. And so, it, you know, the idea here is that is the immune complex causing a problem or is it actually mm. otherwise influencing other parts of the clotting cascade like the heparin binding? Right. So that's why, um, that, so the, the thrombosis, now we're explaining, that's the mechanism. And then the thrombocytopenia, which is part of the name, yeah. is the drop due to the formation of clots. And it's it's vaccine-induced immune because we, we're involving antibodies, which uh, are presumably not not uh, involved in normal clotting, right? There's a, right, and I, I think that that's one of the things that's important related to what Kathy was saying, was that um, this rare complication with adenovirus infection or, or earlier in the vaccine recipients is different than traditional yeah, right. thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. And so a different treatment would be necessary because we're seeing this different sort of mechanism happening. So there's another kind of disorder called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, right? So heparin would, would normally um, inhibit coagulation. But in both cases, the same thing is, is, is the same. They have a common mechanism, that is autoantibodies to PF4. In the one case, it's Got PF4 it. complex with heparin. In the other case, it's not. And it's in fact, as I don't, I don't think it's shown here, but elsewhere, if I'm not mistaken, okay. the, the vaccine-induced uh, uh, version, mm-hmm. the antibody binding, in fact, includes the heparin binding site, which uh, uh, it overlaps it. And I, I don't know the significance about uh, of that. I, I am tempted to say that it could be therapeutically significant. You know, you might be able to knock off an antibody or inhibit the binding with heparin. I well, I know. think that the idea is that it inhibits um, that heparin neutralization. I see. Okay. So heparin dependent and VITT antibodies are binding to different PF4 epitopes, right? Heparin-dependent mm-hmm. recognize the complex of PF4 and heparin. VITT recognize PF4 without heparin. But they, they attach to the heparin binding region on PF4. And then there's another disorder called autoimmune HIT. They have both types of antibodies. And as long as we're totally getting ahead of ourselves here, I have <laughs> to say that if, at least for me, okay, and I think that this is generally true, Although there is, you, there is an association between the administration of the adenovax uh, virus vaccine and the vaccine-induced uh, disease, and you can show that uh, adenovirus complexes can complex with PF4. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, an actual mechanism for that complex inducing the autoantibodies uh, has not been elucidated. That's correct. And I've, seen, I've seen some papers that say, don't get ahead of yourself, dude. Uh, you may not want to spend all your time uh, you know, re-engineering adenovirus so that it doesn't bind because that may, that may not be uh, relevant. Yeah. Okay? It's not known. The actual mechanism of, in detail of how adenovirus does this is not known. That's correct. Right? Right. Okay. So steroids might play a role here in treatment as well, you know, prednisone and things like that. Uh, I think that that's, uh, uh, yeah, used in the heparin-induced disease. Yeah, exactly, routinely. exactly, yeah. exactly. All right, so this is a case report of two individuals who had symptomatic adenovirus infection. We have a five-year-old boy and a 58-year-old woman. They're, they had nasopharyngeal swabs that were positive for human adenovirus and negative for 18 others. So you can do this because there's a panel, uh, a PCR-based panel that checks for all of them at once. You don't have to have 19 different nasal swabs, just one. And that would be uncomfortable. It would. Uh, they had. They both had fever. The child had gastrointestinal symptoms. The adult had respiratory symptoms. And these symptoms, five to six days after the symptoms, they had severe thrombocytopenia, 
coagulopathy, hypofibrinogenemia in both patients, and thrombotic events. Unfortunately, the child had fatal cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, so the child died, unfortunately. Five-year-old child. It's too bad. And uh, the child had multiple strokes. Um, oh, man. It's really too bad. Yeah, they did surgery to try and remove blood clots, cup two thrombectomies. Mm. Yeah. Man, you're just hanging out, and you get clobbered with this. Yeah. That's, what a tragedy. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and um, the, the adult had deep, multiple deep vein thromboses. And uh, neither had gotten heparin before. So they used uh, immunoassays to find uh, VITT-like antibodies to PF4 in serum samples uh, from both patients, you know, ELISA-type assays and so forth. And they, um, they did some epitope mapping, and they found that the anti-PF4 antibodies in both patients bound to amino acids that are in the heparin binding region. So remember, um, those are VITT-like antibodies. Those are the VITT cases, they have antibodies that bind to uh, the heparin binding region. They have a nice single, a big single page figure which uh, displays the clinical course of both of these patients and even the heparin binding epitope. <laughs> So, Vincent, this is not a random occurrence in those two people, obviously. Um, is it predictable based on what they know from the patients as to who might develop this as a result of vaccination? I don't think we know who would, because a lot of people get adenovirus infections, as Kathy said, but this is pretty rare. And this is the right. first yeah. time that we've seen this in association with an ad infection, right? Yeah, so this right. wasn't vaccination. Okay. Yeah, this is an adenovirus right. infection. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. They they give us no clues about any other comorbidities for either of these people. Yeah. So right. we. I mean, okay. it could it, it, be. It's if, a snippet. It's a snippet. Okay. Fine. No, no, it's that's fine. But it could be that if you had enough of these patients, you could do some genome wide associations, right? But uh, well, this is a, a strikes me as part of the problem. This is rare enough. Yeah, it's very rare. So it's going to be hard to make associations. Not only that, but if you think. Uh, if you think you've now engineered an adenovirus that's not going to do this, okay? How do you how do you prove that? Yeah. The, well, that's what I was driving at, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that the points that Kathy made about the actionable items being um, a way to test that this is the issue that's going on in these patients as opposed to other patients, so that perhaps a different treatment regimen could be used um, to help that five-year-old kid is really sure. the big thing that comes from this. Yep. So that's basically it. They say, okay, a life-threatening prothrombotic anti-PF4 disorder can be triggered by symptomatic human adenovirus infection. So uh, this should be included in the differential diagnosis in patients presenting with clinically significant thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, particularly cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So if you haven't gotten an ad vaccine, which you're not going to get in the U.S. anymore, um, then it's possibly an adenovirus infection. So if you look at how they uh, dealt with these patients, uh, there is a steroid treatment involved, prednisone right. and dexamethasone. Right, mm. right, right. right. Uh, there are, uh, in both of them, at least initially, a bunch of tra platelet transfusions because their platelets are crashing. And that strikes sure. me as potentially throwing gas on the fire. <laughs> yeah, I would right. agree with you right. on that one. Right. But that's if you right. don't, I mean, it's if you've got a that's thrombocytopenia, right. that's, not an, that's not an inappropriate thing to do. But if you've got thrombocytopenia that's associated it's with a lot of clotting in weird places, <laughs> right. then, exactly. then you've got to think twice. That's and right. then in the, in the adult patient, there's later on, there's a a procedure called therapeutic plasma exchange mm -hmm. that I don't know what that is, but it, and the, and the platelet transfusions uh, stop. And I wonder if they, yeah, I wonder if they caught on. That, I mean, those both are part of the suggestions at the very end of this paper for mm -hmm. people with this. I don't know what plasma exchange is either. Yeah, it's, that's it. It's exchanging your plasma. Yeah. 
to take it out. We talked about this yesterday on TWIP, Dixon, remember, except for, yeah, we did. for we uh, did. red blood cell exchange for malaria, right? Yeah, yeah, or, total. Or Babesia. You got, you got parasites inside the red blood cells, so you can do an exchange right. with fresh red blood cells, yeah. Sure. So I'm guessing the plasma exchange is just... And that would be plasma that does, that's not got uh, immune complexes the auto, in yeah, it, that's and right. et cetera. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. I know. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, um, so that's that. I uh, thought that might be interesting to talk about. And I, I always find it interesting when we get stuff that we don't know all that much and we just talk about it. It can be useful, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I see something like this, I remember, uh, of course, you know, physicians see this kind of thing all the time, just people getting blindsided by stuff. But I remember... Uh, when our kids were young, uh, one of their, uh, a pair of their friends that were identical twins, one of them wound up in the hospital with some just really nasty respiratory infection, pulled through eventually. But, you know, nobody knew what it was or how to treat it, okay? Uh, and so uh, I'm guessing it was like RSV or something like that. But yeah. uh, you might take them listen. Go ahead, Rich. I'm just sorry. comes out of the blue. That's all. My take on lesson on this is that for every normal process in the body, there's a monkey wrench yeah. <laughs> waiting to be thrown into that. You know, and when you look at the complexity of uh, clotting and uh, all those cascades that, that take place during complement fixation, uh, or the construction of a protein, uh, you can imagine every one of those processes has something that can go wrong. Yeah, it's amazing that we get it right most of the time. Well, that's the other thing, of course. And we've obviously survived through eons of evolutionary selection as a result of that. There's, yep. a, there's a Latin saying for this, Rich. Stercor <laughs> acidit. Okay. You can look it up. Ian uh, oh, come on. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> and I, can't even, Rosanna I, can't even, I can't read my diploma. Roseanne, Rosanna, Dana had a perfect saying for this. If it isn't one thing, it's another. <laughs> uh, means stuff happens, but not stuff, huh. you know? Stuff. Okay, I see. Okay. <laughs> we know what you meant. <laughs> yeah, things happen. What are you going to do? All right. For a paper, so, uh, this is Science Advances, potent pan human ACE2 dependent sarbecovirus neutralizing Monoclonal antibodies isolated from a BNT162B2 vaccinated SARS survivor. SARS, not SARS, not COVID-19. SARS. I didn't, I didn't catch on to that until the end of the paper. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> oh. Right. SARS. So I, I have a I have a sort of a beef with that. Okay. I understand, <laughs> you know, after the 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 Great War, the first world war, it was just the war. And then when World War II came along, they started talking about World War I to distinguish it from World War II. Mm. Now, we had SARS, and then we have another thing that we're going to call SARS-CoV-2. Why can't we call the original one SARS-CoV-1 mm. and not trip up Rich well, and me and lots of other people? Oh, I, I will admit to being tripped up as well, um, but I think that <laughs> part of it is that they are saying SARS here as the disease, yeah, right. not SARS-CoV-1 as the virus. Yeah, but I but they I still I, but but it's also really confusing. But they, they do call the virus SARS, right? SARS-CoV, I think, not SARS-CoV-1. I I think it yeah, should be called SARS-CoV-1. I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, it would just make things. But Much it more is clear. But in this case, it's a disease, so it's not a COVID nineteen survivor. It's a SARS survivor. That's the name. And that. to their credit, in a couple of places, the authors talk about things like SC one positive, SC two positive, like B cells, for <laughs> yeah. example. So yeah, they yeah, yeah, they yeah. recognize that we're going to get confused. But exactly, yeah, exactly right. All right, authors. Uh, we have three first co-authors: Wa Ni Chia, Chi Wa Tan, and Aaron Y Kit Tan, and then, then Wan Nichia is also one of three corresponding authors, along with Shi Mei Lok and Lin Fa Wang, and these are from uh, uh, the the Duke uh, 
National University of Singapore Medical School in Singapore, the National Center for Infectious Diseases in Singapore, the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, University of Utah, Peter Doherty Institute, where Dixon spent some time, right, Dixon? Okay, University of Hong Kong. Dixon, you're, you're muted. muted. Here? Did you there spend you time what? at the Doherty Institute? No. No, oh, that was the uh, Victoria. No, Walter and Eliza Hall. Walter and Eliza Hall, sorry. Close. Uh, University mm, of Hong Kong. Not close, not no? Close. Not even close. Aren't they in Melbourne? Uh, that's not being close. <laughs> There's a lot of They're things in closer Melbourne. Closer than Madison, Melbourne. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a bunch of research going on in Melbourne, that's all I can tell you. And Walter and Eliza Hall was a really small place. Compared oh, I'm sorry. You know what? University. It's right down the bloody street from the Doherty Institute. I know because I went and I, and they said, there's the Walter and Eliza Hall and here's the Doherty. It's right down the street, Dixon. <laughs> I never knew that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> okay. I knew where the zoo was. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I lived next to uh, Kathy, can you give us a summary of this? Sure. So this first couple of sentences are, are lifted right out of the paper. So hmm. passive Im immunization using therapeutic monoclonal antibodies remains an important part of pandemic response and containment. However, unfortunately, all the therapeutic monoclonal antibodies currently licensed for COVID-19 prophylaxis or treatment have no effectiveness against the newly emergent um, viruses of concern. And so this paper uses approaches, which I think are, are pretty interesting, so we'll get into those. But they use these to identify uh, several new monoclonal antibodies, one monoclonal antibody in particular, E7, and it has better SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing potency and breadth than any other monoclonal antibodies reported to date. The monoclonal antibody um, that they identify has a unique receptor binding domain contact footprint. So it, it's binding the receptor binding domain differently from the other monoclonals that have been identified in the past. And it binds to a quaternary structure dependent epitope. And I'll just tell you now that quaternary epitope is a conformational epitope whose structure depends on arrangement of multiple protomers or is enhanced by them or something like that. So, so we have primary structure, which is the sequence of something, and then we have secondary structure, which is um, some additional structure, and then tertiary structure, and now we're talking about quaternary structure, where at least in one definition they say it's multiple protomers. Another one says a quaternary epitope can be located in a single protein of a multimeric complex. Um, mm. But uh, anyway. So what was either way, the, the point is that there have to be multiple subunits. Right. Of a protein. It's not just one individual protein that's fully folded. There's multiple versions, multiple protein, multiple subunits coming together. Right. So the the overall excitement or take home message from this is that, you know, we may be able to use something like this E7 as a monoclonal antibody that'll have uh, a more universal uh, efficacy going forward. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting monoclonal. And um, won't be surprised if it ends up being used. So um, just to put some context to the viruses, there are, so SARS-CoV-2, every, everyone realizes that this is the virus that has caused the COVID-19 pandemic. It, that virus and, and viruses that are close to it, coronaviruses that are close to it, are called clade 1B viruses. And these have been found in, in obviously in humans, right? But also in bats and pangolins, they have been found, clade 1B viruses. Um, then um, we have clade 1A viruses, which are genetically related to SARS-CoV-1. The classic, <laughs> SARS classic. OG SARS, uh, SARS-CoV-1, uh, yeah, the 2003 virus. Um, and uh, there, there are some. Uh, we, we've talked about neutralizing antibodies that uh, cross-react with those. So, as Kathy said, we we would like to have neutralizing antibodies that work against uh, all the variants that are out there, or any new ones that are going to come out. Maybe any future clade one or one A or one B viruses. You know, it's a big ask, but let's see if we can do that. But right now, we don't use monoclonals for, for treating 
uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections because the, the viruses are resistant to them. Um, so in this, in this um, paper, they, they talk about isolating these uh, potent pan human ACE2 dependent Sarbeco virus neutralizing monoclonals from, from a donor in a cohort uh, of people uh, who um, they have a cohort of people who have SARS, who had SARS and uh, who have had COVID-19. And w one of these antibodies, as you see, comes from this cohort. So this, um, these are SARS-1, SARS survivors. SARS is the original <laughs> 2003 disease. Uh, they received the, uh, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. Um, and uh, from them, they, um, they, they have been shown to produce uh, broadly neutralizing monoclonal anti neutralizing antibodies against uh, 10, ACE2 dependent Sarbeco viruses in, in clade 1A and, and 1B, including SARS CoV 2 and other animal Sarbeco viruses. Uh, and so they took. And there really aren't other cohorts of these patients. There weren't that many people who were infected. That's right. Um, and, you know, the, so there aren't that many survivors. Yeah. So, you know, this is a really unique uh, population of individuals that they're able to look at. Yeah, there were only like about 8,000 SARS cases, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's it's, a, well. There are eight thousand deaths. Yeah, or eight thousand cases. Yeah, eight thousand uh, cases. Eight hundred deaths. Eight hundred deaths. Cases. Yeah, that's right. Eight thousand cases. Yep. So uh, I'm going to uh, skip ahead again a little bit because because I, I have a way of thinking about this that I want to test out and it may help in uh, sure. understanding a paper. So these this escaped three of us at least. These people were infected with SARS one. Mm -hmm. So they had immunity to that virus and presumably some memory. Mm -hmm. Now they have been, in effect, in my mind at least, boosted with a SARS-2 vaccine. And, I ha and they're coming up with antibodies that can react with both, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether the, the bottom line here is that the vaccine didn't wind up boosting some memory cell that was left over from the original uh, infection. And you have, uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, uh, well, basically maturation, affinity maturation of the, uh, those antibodies on a new antigen that's related. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's how you get this broadly reactive antibody. Am I making sense? Yeah, no, that's all correct. Okay. So could you get the same antibody by just immunizing with SARS-CoV-2 vaccine? You could, but if you immunize with SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, imagine that you turned on, I don't know, 100 B cells, yeah. each of which made a slightly different antibody mm. against that SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Um these might be like two of the hundred, yeah, right. but they yeah. wouldn't be um, uh, favored for any reason. That's right. Um, yeah. Because um, in these particular patients, those two had previously seen um, mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-1. Mm -hmm. They're now favored to expand better because they're memory cells. Yeah. Uh, um, so they were kind of a, a rare subpopulation before, but now because they have their memory cells, they've already been stimulated once. They're particularly favored. I think this one patient, um, they say, had unusual levels of these cross-reactive antibodies that you don't see in in other people. Usually they're rare, as you say, and so I don't know if it's a function of the Two infections or the patient who had some unusual <laughs> genetics, right? Or or maybe the patient sometime in between had some other Sarbeco yeah, virus sure. that further boosted. I mean, that's so going to yep, be right. essential if you want to try and induce these antibodies, right? You need to know more about how to do that. Yes, Dixon. When you uh, presented the... Um the combination of various MERS together in order to get this antibody to work. It's not against the sequence. It's not against an epitope. It's against a topology. That's mm -hmm. the way I'm envisioning this. So that you get uh, a broader base for uh, the aggregated proteins 
because I looked at the EM pictures also, and they 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 certainly emphasize that. Yeah, so, so it's that, about the 3D structure, not just the yeah, amino exactly, acid exactly. That's that's is uh, Brianna, is that a rare type of antibody? No, that's actually tends to be the general uh, concept of how we talk about how antibodies are binding. But, is the antibodies are binding to 3D structure? But Dixon, it's yeah. still amino acids that are being recognized by the combining side of the antibody. It's just that they're coming from physically distant parts of. The protein. Right. They're right? shared. So don't think yeah. that there's some magical space being recognized. It's, it's amino acids. <laughs> it's still amino because and they do in this paper, they show the contact okay. with okay. amino. But but they're they're far away from each other. They're not just eight or nine amino acids in a row, right? So I I believe the uh uh relevant te- uh, terminology is conformational epitope. That's right. right? That's the deal. How am I doing? <laughs> Very good. That's That's right. Right. And, and, <laughs> but what's special about these is that this is a particularly special con- conformational epitope uh relative to the others, and we'll get yeah, into that. Yeah, that's right. All right. So there's one patient, they took peripheral blood mononuclear cells 23 days after getting that mRNA vaccine, the SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine. They pull out B cells. And then they look for B cells that can bind the receptor binding domain from the spike of both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. So they make tetramers, which they can use a reagent to identify uh, these cells, I presume by flow cytometry, uh, yes. Brianne? Yep. Yes. Um, it's, it's by uh, flow cytometry and uh, fact sorting. Yeah, so not just identify them, but but pull them out. Pull them out. Yeah, pull them out. So pull out those two out of the 100 right. so the, that were uniquely able to bind both viruses. So then they take these cells and they clone out their, their heavy and light chain antibody genes so that they can then make the antibodies and study them, right? And most mm-hmm. of these antibodies, they, they end up making 19 antibodies. They clone out 19 different antibody heavy and light chains. 17 of these were from B cells that have both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 uh, RBD on them and or antibodies to R- They react with the tetramer, the, the reagent with uh, the RBD from both SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And two of those have only SARS-CoV-2 antibody and None from SARS-CoV-1 single positives, right? So most of them have double positives. So they're, the antibody, Brian, are making, the B cells making antibody to both SARS-CoV-1 and 2 RBD, right? Yes. So the, these particular antibodies have the ability to bind to both viruses, not only one or only the other. The technology boggles the mind. Okay, you can pick out of somebody's blood a B cell with yeah. a particular yeah. specificity yeah. and identify the genes for the antibody you're interested in, clone it, express it, right. and check it out. Man. Now, now Brienne, mm-hmm. B cells, a B cell makes a single antibody. So Correct. this means because there's some B cells that are SC1 positive, SC2 positive, that means it's one antibody binding both, right? Yes, I mean it's one antibody that has the ability to bind both. Right. So it's found a common structure. Got it. That it's binding. Okay, it's important. I don't think everybody would would get that. Rich, I was at a meeting just to interrupt uh, a long time ago in Kenya, and um, Caesar Milstein was there, and Caesar Milstein went on to win a Nobel Prize for discovering how to make a monoclonal antibody, mm-hmm. and this is the result of a lot of old work that has accumulated to and allow you like a little erector set <laughs> with all the parts. And I'll take this from here and this from here and this from here, put it together, bingo. But now, it used to be a lot more complex, yeah, I, uh, laborious technology yeah. involving no kidding, a lot no of kidding. cell fusions yep. and, yeah. you know, No, you had to immunize mice. Stuff. You had to pull out their That's spleens, right. make fusions <laughs> with a cell line so they would grow, and then do screens in 96 well plays. It was a pain. Yeah. 
But, there, was, right. there was special it, media involved. I remember <laughs> uh, the first time I learned immunology, having to memorize the components bet, of the special media. You bet media, right? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Monoclonal antibodies came up in the prelim exams that I was on this week, and <laughs> we tried to we tried to get them. Uh, and the, one of the other faculty members said, "Now think about you know." I was trying to get him to figure out how they were made originally, and he said, yeah, 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 "Hybrid yeah. and." Oma, mm -hmm. you know, they, they couldn't come up with the word fusion and they That's did right. know something about immortalization. But then, uh, you know, they've just jumped ahead to how it's done in the 21st century. And it's, it's if, if they amazing. memorize the components of hat media, they <laughs> have to understand the process pretty well. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to look at these monoclonals and compare them to five monoclonals that have been published and, and used, some of them clinically, um, and uh, see how, how these compare to those, right? So, all, so that, again, they take the genes, or I should say the, <laughs> the, 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 they've taken mRNA and made DNA out of it, right? So these are coding regions, and they make the protein, and so they assemble antibodies for each of these uh, 17 uh, monoclonals from the sequence. And all of those 17, these are again from the SC1 positive, SC2 positive B cells. Uh, they bind to both SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV2 RBDs, receptor binding domains, right? A part of the spike protein, shouldn't have, should have said that 20 minutes ago, a part of the spike <laughs> protein that binds ACE2 and which is the target of most of the neutralizing antibodies that are that are discovered. Uh, and in fact, uh, the binding is inferred from the fact that they are neutralizing. Correct. Right? Correct. The, their, their main assay is either a, a pseudo neutralization assay where you have a pseudo typed virus, right. or in some cases, they use real virus. Right. And then they also do binding assays with the protein and, and can calculate affinities. But in, in this neutralization assay, they pick six of the most potent neutralizers and they make a boatload of those a lot of those okay large scale production <laughs> and they study them some more and they decide on three of them that are the best i'm wondering how much a boatload is of, <laughs> of well, depends. i don't know except that i actually would have said boatload as well, so. well it depends it depends whether noah or moses <laughs> filled up the boat all right, All right three, three monoclonals, E7, which keeps bringing HPV to my mind. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> e now you confuse me. I hadn't thought of that. E7, okay. F1, and F5. And they say they use a unique heavy and light chain combination that has never been reported before. So the antibodies, of course, have a heavy and a light chain, a two of each. And this combination has never been reported before. I thought you would like to hear that, but... I don't know, Brian. What is that? These are different antibodies, right? They're unique. Yeah, they're just a unique uh, antibody. They're going to be really different than the monoclonals people were previously working with. Okay. So then, next, they do a boatload of elisas. <laughs> they have <laughs> they have eighteen plex uh, elisa. Basically, they call these surrogate virus neutralization, but they're 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 elisas. Why do they call it surrogate virus neutralization? Because that's figure one. They have Luminex beads coated with the RBD. It's not a, I would say a, a pseudotype is a surrogate neutralization assay. Wouldn't yeah, you say yeah. that, right? Yeah. If you're going to say neutralization, you have to be somehow uh, assaying infectivity. Anyway, they, they check all 18 RBDs from all of these different viruses. And I like this one. Did you, have you heard this word? F, E7, F1, and F5 monoclonals exhibit an ultra potent ab ability to neutralize. I'm sorry, it's not neutralizing. It's just binding, right? Because this is uh, a Luminex B Eliza. type thing, right? Um, and uh, they, but they weren't ultra potent. They say they're less effective against some of them. Um. So, and they, they compare it to some of these other monoclonals that they have. Some of them are not as good as others. I don't think that's so important. But uh, what they do next is um, neutralization assays using pseudotyped reporter viruses. In other words, you take the spike 
of SARS-CoV-2 or any of these uh, viruses and put it on another, it's either VSV or lentiviruses. I don't remember what they did here. And do neutralization assays. Uh, and uh, again, these E7, F1, and F5 have really strong neutralizing uh, activity against the eight. They tested SARS-CoV-2, uh, the ancestral, and four variants of concern, alpha, delta, beta, and gamma, two animal sarbecoviruses, and SARS-CoV. Ultra-potent neutralizing activity against all of them. Now remember, what's missing there is Omicron. That comes later. Because when they started this work, there was no Omicron. So, Vincent, yes. shouldn't, shouldn't they use the term binding constant? Can't Whoa. they calculate a binding constant for it and they have a, a remarkable binding constant? Actually, they, when the they others? do the, the ELISA, they do calculate nanomolar yeah. binding. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. So they do give ultra, that. But, you know. Well, you could say that, you know, 0.3 nanomolar is ultra, ultra you know, yeah. it's, it's fine. But I think you're right. But, it's a little, just give the number, right? Give the number exactly right. Later on, they're going to do plasma and resonance, and that that'll give you even better numbers. <laughs> Can hardly wait. All right, so then they they do deep mutational scanning of the receptor binding domain in yeast to say if we change every amino acid, what's going to be the effect of the binding of these antibodies? It's a way of mapping the um, the epitope of the the antibody and and it's also kind of a nice way to think about what would happen in the future with variants of the spike that haven't yet emerged right. and Good i'm sorry point. whenever i hear deep mutational scanning i think of deep state okay i'm sorry i don't know why i do but anyway or star trek <laughs> it'd be, it'd be. so they find a very different epitope profile of these monoclonals compared to the ones the antibodies that they're comparing them to um, and they all, these epitopes all cluster in a region except for F4, whose footprint covers a wider region, you know, residues from two different places, which is giving a clue about its, um, its three dimensionals. It's, uh, what, what did Rich call it? It's confirmational dependence, right? And they say these monoclonals target, based on this work, highly conserved regions across most of these ACE2-dependent sarbecoviruses. And they say that's why they're probably uh, neutralizing a lot of different viruses because they are highly, highly conserved residues. Ultra-conserved residues, Dixon. I heard that. Ultra-conserved. I heard that. Okay. So let me ask you this. In Couldn't you have discovered this if you had injected this spike protein into mice and then collected their B cells and then come up with all these different types of monoclonals that bind to the same sites? Couldn't that have been done already? Maybe, but it's sort of a numbers game. Um, you could imagine that someone could um, look at the structure of spike. They could take a 3D model of, stri of Spike yeah, yeah. and they could say, I want to have an antibody against yeah, that spot right there. Exactly, right? exactly. Um, and you could do that, but then we don't know how to necessarily make an antibody against that and get a B cell to make that antibody. We can't figure out like which heavy chain and which light chain and which mutations and all of that. And so instead, you have to basically look at what antibodies got made. Because if you can figure out which antibodies uh, got made, uh, uh. you can copy them. These are the survivors that made them, so therefore they must have some relevance. Yeah, and so sure. you know, this is sure. this rare population of people. Sure. It, um, you know, and it, you can also note that it's not every single one of these survivors that made them. Right. So it's sort of a rare thing that happens sometimes. But once we actually see that it happened, we can study how it happened and try to copy it. Mm -hmm. But Dixon, if this were happening in my lab, yeah, so I'd have a somebody screening hybridomas, and they exactly. do, they do five thousand, and they say I can't find anything that's broadly reactive. I'm not doing uh, any more. I said I think yeah. you should do another five thousand. No, I'm not doing <laughs> any more. Do you know the story of how the uh, first muta mutated Drosophila was discovered? Yeah, I do. It was J okay. Thomas Hunt Morgan? Yeah. 
Yeah, and they looked and looked and looked and looked, and they yes. didn't have any, and they were going to give up. And some guy comes in in the morning and says, wait a minute. This one with a white eye. This little yeah. a wing. Oh, it was a wing. I thought no, it was, it was a, a white eye, eye. And, white eye, and it was very sickly. And then Thomas Hunt Morgan's wife went into the hospital to have a baby. He went to visit her, and she said to him, how's the white fly? How's the white-eyed fly? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because she was, And the thing is, they didn't do any mutagenesis. No, they didn't realize that they had to do that because we didn't know what a gene was, right? They did, but not. later on, people figured out the UV could give you more white eyes and so forth. Yeah, but they didn't give up. That's the point. They did not give up. Yeah, well, it's difficult to get people to do things sometimes because they right? knew they were right. You are limited by the human factor, right? I understand. And I, I as a poor lab manager, wouldn't know what to do. I said, well, "You have to do five thousand. Please do five thousand more." No, I'm not doing five. Okay. So we let nature do this for us in this case. Well, it was a unique combination of SARS-1 and, and vaccination yeah, against SARS-2, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 Which right. tells me you have to try everything. And, right. and having a flow cytometer and the ability to sort the cells. <laughs> For sure. Right. They then, yeah, and, the, and the foresight to... Um, Insight, I think. Yes, that's right. Well, I was going to say, Sorry. yeah, that they, um, that they captured this sample from this person 23 days after the first vaccination dose, yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. thought, oh, this could be useful some yeah. days or something. Remember, know. luck favors the prepared mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, absolutely the critical thing. Well, is, why is, did Jenner wait two weeks after giving the guy right. cowpox to, to challenge him? Two weeks. It was a good timing, right? It was good yeah. timing. Timing, timing. All right. So they do... Uh, they measure affinity now of these antibodies using, um, uh, you know, proteins immobilized uh, and also biolayer interferometry, which is a fancy way of measuring affinity of uh, a ligand and, and a receptor. And they find that these three monoclonals, E7, F1, and F5, have an affinity, um, I would say EC50. Uh, uh, half maximal effective concentration, less than 25 nanomolar. So it's very good affinity. And then they also look to see whether these antibodies will block uh, attachment of the RBD to ACE2. And uh, these three, E7, F1, F5, again, they can disrupt all the RBD ACE2 combinations uh, that they test. Um, but they also find, and this is, I wanted to highlight this. This is very interesting. Some of the other antibodies performed poorly in, the, in their ability to inhibit the RBD-ACE2 interaction, but they still had um, good affinity to the proteins, which they say it shows that binding ability does not always equate to neutralizing ability. And I don't know how many times you have seen people publish papers where they measure affinity of RBD ACE2, and they say, this is going to be a better infector, this is going to be a better whatever, and it's not always related to affinity. They they themselves do an ELISA and say that that's a neutralization assay. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, I have a, a thought or a question about this that I was thinking about as this was going on. So they're basing their evaluation of these things on a, an in vitro neutralization test. Sure, sure. Okay. And which is probably about the best you can do, uh, you know, short of a clinical trial or something like that. But, uh, and it's what they, that's kind of what they have available. But that doesn't mean that there can't be, a, 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 it, this is a question. That doesn't mean that there can't be antibodies that bind to spike and don't neutralize, but would be quite therapeutic mm -hmm. or protective, right. right? Yeah. It's just that you got no way to assay those in vitro. Uh, you have a different way to assay those in vitro, which is not the experiment that they've set up. Uh, what's the different way to assay those in vitro? So, I mean, if you, you can look at things like um, whether you can improve macrophage um, binding or whether okay. you could improve NK cell binding or something okay. like that. But yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to no. be neutralizing to be effective. Nope. In right? fact, okay. in fact, one of the no. uh, one of the Ebola monoclonals does not neutralize, yet it helps clinically in animal right. models. Probably, right. as Brianne was saying, by FC mediated functions. Right. So yeah, neutralization is not the whole thing. 
And so are there clinical trials planned for this antibody? Well, you need to do some that, preclinical stuff first, right? You need to do some mouse or non-human primate experiments. Yeah. Because it could be, to address Rich's point, maybe these don't even protect in an animal model, or maybe not all of them. I don't know. You'd have to test it, right? So here's a question. If you get neutralizing activity in a cell culture model, in vitro, in cells and culture, will those antibodies protect an animal from infection? Good point. 100% of the time. I don't know the answer to that because I haven't done that many of these. I just wonder if there are some good neutralizers that don't protect animals for whatever reason. Is there an animal model for that? I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can use you can use a variety of uh, animals for this. Yeah, and they, they and will do no... that. They will do that next before going into people, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. But... Yeah, you need that preclinical data, sure. Um okay, so then they <laughs> if that's not enough, they determine the structure of E7 to the uh spike trimer. And this is where they find the interesting observation that this is binding a quaternary epitope because it's it's binding two different. Re so remember, the spike is a trimer, three copies of spike, and this and often it's a mix of RBD up or down, right? And this antibody binds across two RBDs in that trimer, one up and one down. So that's why it's quaternary, right, Kathy? Because it's uh -huh. two uh -huh. spike proteins, not just tertiary, right? But Not a fully folded one spike protein, two. but two, two fully folded spike proteins. This is beautiful science, really beautiful science. Mm -hmm. The picture so let's, for themselves. Let's review the significance of RBD up and down. So the right, the receptor binding domain is hinged to the rest of the protein. That's right. right. So it can have a, it can relative to the stem, it can have a, an up conformation, which is means sort of continuous with the stem, or one where it's down, where it's it's on the hinge is sort of flopped over, and it has to be at least one of them has to be in the up configuration to engage the receptor. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, at least one, but I don't know how many are optimal, right? I don't remember. Which is ACE2, by the way. Which is ACE2, yeah. Right. Sure. yeah. Right. So this antibody locks onto an up and a down. And, uh, mm. well, we're going to talk about the mechanism uh, a bit later, but... It's gorgeous. Right? Absolutely gorgeous. So, and and then from this structure, you can see exactly the amino acids that are being contacted by E7. They say most of the residues... Oh are strongly conserved and all most of the ones on the up portion of the RBD are absolutely conserved. <laughs> so there's two strongly conserved and absolutely. So strongly is some of them are not conserved, right? Absolutely. They're all conserved. That's my. Not ultra conserved. They're not ultra conserved. <laughs> but it could be an ultra conservative, Dixon. That could be an ultra conservative. That's right. All right. Um, so then they they say at this point in our research, Omicron arrived. <laughs> so we had to read. I'm, and I'm just I'm I'm imagining I'm going. Oh no! <laughs> Come on! Yeah, um, we just got our grant for God's sake. So we well, maybe they want to submit this, and maybe the reviewers said you have to look at yeah, Omicron. Gotta Either check way, Omicron, so they dude. they look at uh, a variety of Omicron subvariants, um, and some of them. Um, are not neutralized, right? They reduce, they lose neutralization potency. Uh, BA1 is neutralized by all three antibodies, but only E7 neutralizes BA2. They, also, they look at BA1, BA2, 5, 2, 7, 5, 2, 4, 6, 1, BF7, BQ11, and XBB1. They look at all of those. So B E7 has reduced potency to BA2. Um, uh, and BA1, but there is an, a tenfold improvement from BA2 compared to BA5. And the newer subvariants, BQ11 and XBB, were not more resistant to E7 uh, than, than the previous ones. Uh, they're still sensitive to neutralization. They say there must be synergistic effects among the different uh, parts of the epitope. So in other words, uh, as, as the uh, variants are changing, that can impact uh, the neutralization. In fact, uh, they they think that there's a specific amino so there's a specific amino acid that changed in one of the Omicron variants and then it reverted, 
And the reason they think it reverted is because that original change it made the virus less fit. So there was pressure for it to revert. And that reversion partially suppresses the, the resistance of the spike to E7. So that's an interesting mechanism, isn't it? That that change was not fit, so it went away, and and uh, it suppresses resistance at another amino acid. So their sort of quickie way of evaluating how good these antibodies are with uh, any given uh, virus or a uh, antigen is to report the concentration of antibody required to neutralize fifty percent of the infectivity. Okay? That's right. Right. Uh, and uh, E seven is the only one out of all the uh, the best ones that can uh, still uh, have some activity against all the various Omicron variants, right. okay? Even though uh, it's reduced activity in particular against uh, BA2. What's not clear to me is what the, how you translate that quantitation to what might be therapeutic. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, I, I, I suppose you can compare them you could compare those numbers to the monoclonals that you know are therapeutic, all right? Yeah. And I didn't right, actually yeah. do that. Yeah, I think that's what they would do uh, when when going at the people, yeah. So the E7 is unusual because it does this uh, quaternary epitope. Um, and that I would guess that's the one that would be put into uh, preclinical in animals and maybe eventually make it into people. Um, they say that E7 might have two different ways of neutralizing. It could, on one hand, inhibit spike or RBD binding to ACE2, but it might also inhibit fusion because fusion needs the spike to reorient after binding. And they say this antibody could block that reorienting because it's binding to two neighboring spike subunits, right? So it's conceivable that fusion is which might also explain its potency right that's pretty cool all right so infection with SARS-CoV followed by vaccination with SARS-CoV-2 you get potent pan human ACE2 dependent neutralizing antibodies and, and remember that's or or at least this one individual this one person <laughs> yeah right but now we know a model of we can try to make more right so would you try to immunize first with SARS-CoV-1 spike and then SARS-CoV-2? There would be there are some I I don't know for SARS, but I know for some other situations that is the idea. Hmm. Is thinking about an order of different types of immunogens to try to push more B cells along this path. Of course, this is going to this could be used therapeutically, right? As a as an oh, antibody yeah. that you treat people with. But if you want to induce these kinds of antibodies, which would be good, right? Potentially, I mean, vaccinating yeah. is going to always be better than giving people monoclonals. Yeah. So, right? so then you could try to come up with a vaccine that could give you really broad protection. Right. Right. But but I mean, you've already. I mean, uh, you can't with this information necessarily design a vaccine that would uh give you an antibody that would see this same conformational complex conformational epitope right no i mean you'd have to basically try to think about you know if you gave the uh vaccinated individual if you gave the vaccine sars1 spike you know exactly the right epitope to hit these B cells and then maybe other epitopes so that you could select out this unique B cell and give it multiple stimulations without trying to stimulate the other B cells that were only binding SARS-1 or only binding SARS-2. So you'd need to figure out kind of a maybe a bunch of doses that would all specifically hit this B cell and lead to a memory response. So I'm envisioning a future where uh, in anticipation of, you know, maybe a bunch of uh, related but uh, not completely cross-reacting nasty viruses are out there, there could be an immunization protocol that would just, that, that might do just that, a series of immunizations with uh, the different beasts uh, to, well, I suppose, you know, that's, Mm. There, there's there's a idea in the HIV field about 
something like that uh-huh. um that people have talked about um if it were me i would and i was thinking about this problem i would ideally be going for maybe like a broad corona um neutralization you know as broad as i could get among the coronaviruses mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I would wow. try. I would try. You could do it in mice. You could. I mean, I, I would try spikes, yeah. COVID one, and then two. Just try it. But remember, right. these people had COVID one infection, so that may be different, also, right? Well, and they mentioned that this one patient was particularly unique, so maybe yeah. that patient had another infection in the middle or something like that. Do you think there's any uh, hope of treating the spike with? certain selective proteases to eliminate most of the epitopes that are irrelevant to this confirmation and still keep the confirmation so that when you immunized, you only have what you really want and you're not deflecting the immune system off in various directions. I think people are doing that for some viruses. Mm. Um, I know that there's some ideas for flu for that, for example. Um, And that's where I would, you know, call a biochemist friend. Well, you could, I would not know how to do it. You could imagine making, so if this epitope is two landing spots, right? Yeah. Yeah. You could imagine making a peptide with a linker in between and, or or maybe variations Mm -hmm. because you don't know how long to make it so that it would fit into the combining site, right? Fold. You have the the antibody to let you know whether you did it right or not. Yeah. You could see if it binds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a job for artificial intelligence. You could do it. There a, you, go. you could do a library right. of of peptides with different exactly. length, different length exactly. linkers. Exactly. So the two epitopes exactly. with different lengths, and just throw them all in, see which binds the uh, the antibody. Yeah, piece of cake. well, it's not a piece of cake, but it's there. It can be done. It is it is accessible by today's technology. Yes. Right. Yes, that's the point. That anyway, the I thought point. this was very uh, interesting yeah. that uh, you could get such a good antibody. I'm I'm amazed at that last figure of CR three o two two. If I were in the lab and I had that result, and I told somebody, they wouldn't believe me. Virtually every single one of them came up over eighteen thousand. Isn't that an eighteen thousand error? Yeah, I think so. It's it's remarkable to see how uniform that one particular reading is compared to all the other results you got. What figure are you on, Dixon? The last I, one. I think he's on five C. For this before the discussion, the oh, one I just Yeah, I think he's on five C. And my guess is that that's sort of the limit of the assay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But no no yeah. other group looks like that. Right. <laughs> and you know, oh and you'd call up, you know, your lab supervisor, guess what we just just you know, do it again. <laughs> just just do it again <laughs> must have misnumbered the tubes <laughs> so uh, alright that's good that's enough of that yeah here we go um, there is uh, let's let's read uh, let's do one round of email yeah uh, Kathy can you take the first one uh, Mary. Mary writes hi Vincent and Twivers I'm going to out myself as Mariposa which is my New York Times commenter handle. I was so tickled that Rose Hoban, health reporter and founding editor, North Carolina Health News, sent you my comment singing the praises of TWIV and your local epidemiologist on a recent New York Times article about COVID titled, uh, oh, Amid Signs of a COVID uptick, researchers brace for the new normal. In fact, I sing your praises every chance I get, but sadly, many of my friends, family, neighbors, and acquaintances are so done with COVID that they aren't interested, yet I persist. And it's good to know that I have the best information in my pocket to whip out when someone has a question, if they ever do. I heard your plea for support, so I just signed up on Patreon. Thank you again, Mariposa. What does Mary, Mariposa, Mariposa mean? Well, Spanish um, for... I don't know, but I'm I'm breaking it down into Mary, who's posing <laughs> no, on the no, comments. It's, a, it's, a Spanish, it's a Spanish word. I think it's a Spanish yeah. word, like yeah. butterfly or something. Yeah, it's like butterfly. That. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. So. Oh, that's so cool. I'm glad Mariposa yes. was listening. <laughs> yes, and thanks for signing up on Patreon. Yes, thank you that's very nice. much. Indeed, indeed. Uh, let me take the next one. This is from JP, because JP writes, I'm hoping this feedback will be forwarded to Dr. Racaniello. Well. I got it. I didn't have to be forwarded. <laughs> I shared this special episode. So this is Desiree Thompson Townsend. 
I shared the special episode with Desiree Townsend with a group of like-minded scientific types, which most appreciated one, however, pushed back and shared some links to videos with pretty disturbing videos of Miss Townsend that I want to send. Miss Townsend seemed quite genuine on the TWIV episode, but after viewing these early videos, I'm uneasy. I said to my friend, Miss Townsend seems to have seen the light, or perhaps more accurately, a former cult member who's been successfully deprogrammed. After seeing the links below, I wondered if Dr. Racaniello was aware of them. If not, I wish he had been and would have respectfully confronted her about her past, no matter how noble her current actions are. And so JP sends links to... Uh, couple of video old videos from from Desiree in the in the 2009 era so I sent this to Desiree and she replied uh, thank you for writing in I understand your unease but please refer back to the podcast starting at 31 minutes where I discuss how inside edition who produced the videos you linked to spun the, spun the segment to increase ratings I had been on treating medication for the disease for at least four months before inside edition ever approached me which allowed me to walk without spasms so she had developed these spasms after stiff leg syndrome, I think it's called, which, which Celine, stiff person syndrome, stiff person. And so, you know, she thought people convinced her it was the flu vaccine. And of course it wasn't. Uh, this is a very important point because if, if after I explicitly explained this on the TWIV episode, you, you or your colleagues still do not believe me, nor have changed your thoughts of me, then what hope do we have in changing the beliefs of the anti-vax movement? If we are to make any change in the anti-vax movement, we have to serve as role models and be open to changing our own previously held assumptions or beliefs. Otherwise, there's little hope for any change at all. If you or your colleagues have further questions, I would be more than happy to address them. And she shares her email. All right. I, I asked her about them. I said, the, these videos, which you look normal and people said you were faking your illness. And so that's, I asked her that on the podcast and she explained it. So uh, not hiding anything. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one? You're muted. You're muted, Dixon. Hello, Dixon. Dude. Dude, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll try it again. <laughs> Lear writes, hey there, I love listening to the clinical update every week. A friend told me about Inovid. The site shares some clinical data, and she lists the clinical site. And I found an article in PubMed, which I'm attaching to the message. It sounds like it could be useful in both treatment and prevention, although I'm primarily interested in the latter, since I would take Paxlovid if I tested positive. However, if it's as good as they say, I imagine you guys would have talked about that. And in the company, <clears throat> and the company would have been, uh, and the company would have applied for FDA approval. Also, my daughter asked if regular use would increase immunity debt, assuming such a thing exists. Thanks for your help, Leah. There's an article. Is a, um, article. Where is it? Uh, There's a link down below, right? Oh, it's a Lancet Lancet article. Yeah. SARS-CoV-2 accelerated clearance using a novel nitric acid, nitric oxide nasal spray, <laughs> a randomized trial. So this nitric oxide spray, they, they administered it six times daily as two sprays per nostril, six times a day, two sprays per nostril. And Isn't that laughing gas? <laughs> no, it's not laughing gas. No. <laughs> it's not laughing gas. And, and this reduced... Uh, RNA copy number, right, by PCR, and it reduced the time to no detection of RNA compared to placebo. But there's nothing about, if I remember, there's nothing about symptoms here. Um, so I, I didn't think that it presented anything useful. Yeah. Um, proportion of subjects with improvement of greater than or equal to in score. And the, the results, so in other words, improvement in clinical score, it's pretty um, minor change. Yeah, it's marginal. And six times a day, two sprays per nostril, nitric oxide, is that going to be good? I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, when I first heard about this, I expected that it was sort of modulating immune responses. Mm. Okay. Um, and because I know that there are some places where nitric oxide is um, related to immune responses, this talks about it as um, impacting the virus, so inter- altering structural integrity of viral proteins um, and interfering binding to spike. Um, so that wasn't really what I expected. Yeah. And I don't exactly understand what the mechanism would be here. I mean, they conclude that this accelerates nasal virus clearance, but it doesn't seem to impact clinicals much. I just don't know. Needs more work. That's what Daniel says, because people have asked him, he said it needs more work before we start spraying nitric oxide into our nose or or a nitric oxide producing compound, right? That's the way it works. Yeah. There are are a huge number of listings if you just type out nitric oxide on the internet it's very confusing but you're right um uh leah uh if it were good we would have talked about it (laughs) most likely (laughs) so brianne leah says would would this increase immunity in other words you wouldn't build up immunity as well if you're inhibiting infection right that's the idea i I guess so because I don't understand how it's working. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't tell you. Um, I'm not generally super worried about immunity debt um, because I think that you're generally exposed to so many microbes in a day that your immune system is is has plenty to do. Yeah, it's working overtime. <laughs> um, Dixon, you took one already. You just took that one. Kathy took one. I took one. So, Brianne, you, you're next, please. All right. Tom writes, TWIV 1028 asymptomatic. Missing data is OTC analgesics. Given the common large economy size of OTC analgesics used for exercise, hangovers, colds, and other discomforts, there is likely... Yes, speculation. Opportunity for masked mild symptoms. Tens of millions of doses are sold and prescribed, and they are effective symptom reducers. Early rapid tests could be expected to be negative, so OTC cold and flu products will be consumed for relief of discomfort. Add OTC med sales to sewage tracking. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good idea. (laughs) Doesn't Google flu uh, track OTC sales, something like that. It did. It doesn't anymore. No. Google Google flu has actually ended. Oh, why, oh. why did they do that? Um, I can find articles about it. Uh, I was because I used to use it in class, and for one of my classes, I went to some of their yeah. information and okay. saw that they had taken it. They stopped using it, and they have a long article about why. Uh, but I don't remember all the details all now. Right. All right, one more, Rich. Uh, you are right. Uh, dear Vincent, I've been listening to TWIV for at least 10 years, likely longer. My memory's not all that good. <laughs> and wrote in a couple of times with some comments. It's been a great pleasure to listen to your discussions of papers as well as all the sidetracks and rants. Well, you got a boatload for, uh, of them this time. <laughs> I'm writing this time because in recent episodes, especially the one with RFK Jr., I felt your frustration with the various denialists out there. And I think I can offer some helpful comments. I'm a virologist with a PhD and experience in working in academia, nonprofit, biotech, and most recently pharma. Uh, It so happened that I started a blog in 2002 and then began writing about science around 2003, primarily about my area of expertise, HIV. The blog was one of the very small number of Russian language science blogs, and thus became quite popular and well-known in the Russian-speaking internet community. As such, it became a magnet for all kinds of denialists. I did not uh, turn them away or block them, but instead engaged with them, spending hundreds of hours, literally, over many years on arguments and conversations, trying to understand their positions while arguing mine. Speaking from this experience, I would say that the approaches and tactics you discussed in the recent episodes are very unlikely to be successful. I tried to summarize my suggestions to it uh, uh, in an email, but it came out so wordy that I deleted it, and I'm now writing this second shorter version 
with the offer to come at some point to TWIV and discuss what I learned over all these years. I hope it's not too presumptuous of me. Very briefly, bullet points. Even when people are irrational, they use logic to support their positions. Bullet point. Be aware of the context of the conversation and define what success looks like. Bullet point. Losing a fight has more impact than winning, so don't get into fights lightly. Good point. Bullet point. Know your opponents and their arguments before engaging or you will lose. Happy to chat more if you're interested. Best regards, Igor. Um, who's currently director of U.S. scientific collaborations at uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, and he gives a, a link to his blog. You know, I really like best the uh, metaphor that came up in uh, an email from a listener about debating with people like this, and that it's like playing chess with a pigeon, that they... Uh, knock over all the pieces, crap all over the board, and then fly away declaring victory. Uh, and we have discussed on many different occasions the difficulties in doing this, and in particular how, you know, sort of numbers and statistics and reason don't really uh, mm. help. If you want to convince somebody, it's the it's the story that does it. It's the emotional appeal. But it's a it's a real problem, and I appreciate this input. So I went to his blog, which is in Russian, but I have the Google Translate plugin. Yay. And I can translate the whole page. It's so cool. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. I remember, uh, Igor, from previous emails. I haven't seen you in quite a while. Used to write in now and then. Yep. All right. Time for some picks of the week. Dixon, what do you have today? You're muted. Yes, well, I've got something other than a jazz pick, and um, I'm fascinated with the uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. I just I can't get enough of it. Um, it's the deepest look we've ever had into where we live compared to where we came from. So I'm I'm getting philosophical in my old age, I guess, and I'm interested in knowing how do all this began, and that's what the purpose of the Webb's telescope is, is to look back in time to a point when the universe was very young. The biggest surprise there was that they still see galaxies. At any rate, this is a shot of the Rho Opichiuchi Nebula, showing massive star formations celebrating the first year's anniversary of the Space Telescope. And I'm um, <clears throat> reminded that um, there are some remarkable quotes out there that, that uh, address this issue as, as to what you're looking at. Uh, we are all made of star stuff, is a quote from Carl Sagan, and reiterated by Crosby, Stills, Dash, and Young in their hit song, Woodstock. And then I listened to it about 18 times recently. It's really, it's a great song. It's an absolutely great song. I didn't even know this line was in it. We are stardust, that I knew. We are golden. We are 10 billion year old carbon. I never knew yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't know so that one either. That. Yeah. And if you look at this, I've, I've, I've listed the uh, YouTube website for it. So you can mm. listen to it after the show. And it's mm. wonderful. It's just wonderful music. And it's it it uh, plays off of Carl Sagan's remark that we are all made of star stuff. And here you can see the star stuff. These are little points of light. If you look at the red zone over here, uh, it looks like those molecules that we just looked at, by the way. Um, and you look at the tips of each one of those little points, that's a star forming. Each one of those little uh, disks that you see in the darker zone, upper right-hand corner, uh, not the sparkly little things with the shining lights coming out of them. Those are nearby stars. This is a this is the nearest nebula to Earth, by the way. What's a nebula? A nebula is a collection of gas uh, made up of various particles and various chemicals, and from it, it condenses by gravity into a cluster, mm -hmm. and then finally into a unit, and then finally into what could be a star. And um, when the star reaches a certain volume and a certain pressure, it ignites. 
and the uh, nuclear furnace is lit. <laughs> and it can either last 10 billion years or 10 million years, or it depends on the kind of star. Hmm. And the star, when it's formed, usually is a binary. Half of the stars in the universe are double stars. And many of them, many of them have planets. So it's just remarkable to look at this. So this one and is the, in the, this is a star being formed, basically. All of these little points are stars forming in this gigantic gas cloud made up of elementary matter. So so wait a minute. Most of it's hydrogen. Most of it's hydrogen. The, the, what do you mean all these the little vision. points, these little white dots? No, look at, look at the red zone. Okay, yeah, yeah, to the yeah. Right. I see. And each one of those little red dots oh, is a okay. star forming. Okay. I think and this is just made up. I don't believe any of it. <laughs> <laughs> like, how can it be? You know, how could this be? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just joking. I mean, it's just, it's, it, well, you know what it reminds me of? It looks like an octopus ingesting some crustacean. How far away um, is this, Dixon? How many light years away is this? Um, I didn't get an exact number, but it's the closest one to Earth. And this light um, that's just reaching us left like tens of thousands of years. Billions ago. of years ago. Billions. Billions? Of years ago. Well, a yeah, long time ago, million. a long, long time maybe ago million. in a galaxy I'll far, far away, right? <laughs> exactly okay. right. But it's beautiful. It's it's actually gorgeous. It doesn't look By like the that way, anymore. I can never understand any lyrics in any song. I don't, <laughs> I have never understood it. Even when I was young and had good hearing, I could never figure out lyrics, except maybe, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Joni Mitchell. I could figure out Joni Mitchell and... And Judy Collins. Those are the only two I could understand because yeah. they sang clearly. Everyone else, like this Crosby, Stills, and Nash, it's all muddled. I can't understand it. But they publish the lyrics, though. So you can. Well, nowadays they do, but back in the day, <laughs> before the internet. <laughs> you know, back in the day, you're absolutely right. And, and there are some people who can get the lyrics. And I was yeah, always right. amazed that they knew what the lyrics were. And I thought they had a special <laughs> gift, perhaps. I don't know. I didn't know that that 10 billion, we are 10 billion year old carbon. Yeah, that's a that's a line from a song. Wow. That's amazing. That's truly amazing. Ah, cool. Thank Ten you, Dixon. You're welcome. You're welcome. Brian, what do you have for us? So I was sort of inspired by Dixon's pick. Um, <laughs> the uh, space. There, I picked a space dot com article yeah. that actually I almost uh, used as my pick last week, um, which starts with another James Webb image um, of some. Hmm stars forming called uh hair big haro 4647 um and it's incredibly high resolution you can mm -hmm. see these stars mm -hmm. forming and you can see all sorts of stars in the background or, or so, all sorts of things in the background and because it's so high resolution you can start to zoom in on them uh, and when you zoom mm -hmm. you start to see um little galaxies and things like that and you find something that looks Absolutely like a question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly um, right. This has actually picked up more um, press. The New York Times wrote about it today. Um, and there is basically <laughs> this question mark um, that people have found uh, in this cute. image uh, in space. And uh, they are now trying to figure out exactly what it is. Um, and there are some hypotheses that this may be some interacting galaxies um, or. Um, you know, it's it's leading to new hypotheses about what in the world um, this little question mark shape could be. But it's just kind of fun to look at this picture and see, you know, in this incredibly high resolution image of space. Right. That's what I I'm wonder seeing. if that's where deep thought is located. That probably <laughs> is it. <laughs> but Rich, it, we're going to see 42 one of these days. Uh, right? Yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. What, that's what right. it reminds me of is that. You know, the human brain wants to see patterns or yeah. see things that it yeah. recognizes. And so, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of microscopy images. And I just saw a, sure. a cover article for, for an old journal of virology where they had <laughs> some, something shaped like a heart and they false colored yeah, yeah, yeah. it four times. Mm -hmm. And that's right. That's right. You know, we look at clouds and we see things. Yeah. Here, here, so, in these pictures, yeah. uh, both the Dixon one and this one, you have these bright points of light with these spikes. You know what? What is that? Just an artifact of oh, the, the spikes. The spikes oh, are those... uh, they're a di a diffraction off of the uh, spokes on the telescope. That's correct. I see. So it's it's artificial. It's an artifact. Yeah. Of some kind. Yes. that's right. 
it's, it's they a, can actually computerize it and get rid of them if they wanted to. Yeah, because cool. um, they are new. Cool. What's his oh, name? Really the like J.R. the Carol, the director, uh, J.R. Abrams, J.J. Abrams, right? He he likes to make those art on on purpose. Spec he calls them specular highlights. I think no. What does he call them? J.J. Uh, Abrams light light flares. Yeah, uh, he likes, light flares. He he makes them a lot in his movies. Oh, and he used to, when he was first doing it, he used flashlights and now he does them, you know, digitally. Cool. <laughs> uh, Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked a YouTube that's about 18 minutes long and it's a David Quammen interview with Walter Isaacson. Oh, no. And if you didn't see, or even if you did see the New York times, a Sunday magazine article, uh, from July 30th, it was actually published online July 25th, and I put the link in there for that. It, anyway, he has a really nice long-form story that uh, is then kind of captured in brief in this interview with Walter Isaacson, and it just spells out um, his the evolution of his thoughts about the origins of the SARS-CoV-2. And he's so eloquent. You know, we had him on the TWIV episode and and just uh, listening to and watching this episode, it, it, he just makes his points very clearly. And Walter Isaacson is, is an amazing great. sort he's of great. devil's advocate because he'll ask questions <laughs> kind of like almost like a conspiracy theorist would in, <laughs> in like a, a sort of aggressive sort of way. And David Quammen just calmly addresses them. That's right. But, Anyway, if you if you didn't read the story, you can watch this interview. And, yeah, the and story the was un, unfortunately for me sort of a TLDR, so I'll have a look. At that. <laughs> it's a oh, long story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's quite yeah. long. But it's it's a short. It's shorter than a book. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, it's good. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, so while I have the floor, I want to preface my pick, uh, or uh, uh, actually. Yeah, whatever. I have a correction to make from the last episode that I should have brought up earlier. It's minor, but I have to do it. Uh, I, um, in introducing the last paper, talked about the authors or some of them being from, I think I said, UT Southwestern San Antonio. There is no such thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. UT Southwestern is in yeah. Dallas. Yep. Uh, and I learned from corresponding with Yan that there are actually two UT campuses in San Antonio. One's an undergraduate campus, which is UT San Antonio, UTSA. And the other is UT Health San Antonio, which is the medical center, UT Health SA. So there, I apologize for that uh, mistake. That's done. Um, I picked the Chrome Music Lab, okay, which is a Google Chrome site with all sorts of little experiments that you can do with uh, 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 musical in nature. I picked it among other things because what I really like is the spectrogram, right? Uh, where you can, I mean, there's all sorts of these out there. This is not unique. Um, but if you, it, it has a bunch of different squares where you can uh, choose these and pick different things that you want to play with. Uh, the spectrogram uh, is a, uh, spectrogram. You can speak into this thing, and it will display uh, the basically the frequencies that you're speaking. Mm. Where I believe the way it works is the frequencies are on the y-axis. There's a time scale on the x-axis, and then it's colorized so that the amplitude shows up in the colors. And if you play different instruments or if you mess around with your voice and that kind of stuff, you can see how that shows up uh, on the spectrum. Um, uh, vocalists use this kind of stuff uh, to play with how they pronounce and shape their vowels and stuff. Have you ever done this, Kathy? Okay, we, we get a lot of exercises uh, in the chorus about how to how to do our vowels to get the biggest or most pleasant mm -hmm. sound, and you can make you know measurements of what your uh, vocalization is doing and how your vowels affect all this by looking at a spectrograph and you want to get a wide spectrum. Okay. And get overtones and that kind of stuff. It's very interesting. Cool. So at any rate, Neat. there are other, there are other bits of this, uh, 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 music lab that you can play with that are fun. Neat. 
That'd be good to I resisted that does sound clicking. Like I didn't want to make noise. Uh, it doesn't make noise until so you get into it. It okay. does not make All right. noise. Okay. All right. My pick is a, is a new podcast at Microbe TV called Matters Microbial by Mark O. Martin. It's up to number three. You can go to microbe.tv slash MM. And Mark is uh, doing short interviews with microbiologists. That he knows today's is Seth Bordenstein. Last week was Maya Breitbart. I was number one. Um, and uh, he asked them a couple of questions about uh, their their training and, and their work. So they're, they're shortish, 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, you should check them out. Make them feel good. <laughs> cool. Excellent. It matters microbial. And this is, I am not involved in this, actually. Uh, I, I have been involved to the extent of getting it up and running, but I hired a producer to take care of it, and she is recording and editing and posting. I taught her how to do it all. It is an example of how I can let go <laughs> sometimes. Oh. I don't have time to do more shows, and I want to do no. more shows. So, But Mark has always wanted to do this, so I said, we will produce it for you. So, Microbe TV, thanks to the generosity of our listeners, I can pay a producer to uh, to do this work. And, you know, we you have to get a website and pay for that, and there are other expenses as well. So, thank you all for supporting us, and please continue to support us, even as the pandemic is winding down or over, whatever you think. Uh, we still need your support to get good science information out there because uh, it it's difficult. Uh, we have two listener picks from Tom. This may interest your viewers, a new video about the variola virus from the Animation Masters, whose YouTube channel is called Kyrgyz Act in a Nutshell. Thank you for your informative podcast. Thank you, Tom. I bet Rich would like to watch that. I'm going to, uh, oops, I got to. Uh, you better make nice. sure it's right, okay? Uh, I will have a look at this. Uh, yeah, they had a recent video that wasn't so great. Yep. I used to really love this site. I know. They had an Origins video. It was sad. Yeah. Yeah. Vincent, you mentioned variola. I used to hear that as variola, which is correct. I've heard both pronunciations. So, uh, uh, yeah, I've heard both. Which do you prefer? I, I don't prefer. <laughs> I, I so, so, Grant McFadden calls it variola, right, Rich? Yeah, I think I do, too. And so I'm influenced by McFadden and Condit, you know. I see. What do you call it, Kathy? I think I say variolas also. <laughs> but I think I originally like heard it in my brain as variola. Yeah, oh, yeah me exactly. too. I used to say variola until I heard them say it. And they said, well, <laughs> they're the experts. And then whenever I say it, there's always someone who said, what are you talking about? <laughs> like you, Dick. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's right. No, I, I asked you which you preferred. That's all. No, I, I like variola. I think it's good. Um, okay. Do you like potato or potato? Both. Okay. <laughs> Charles, and we have one from Charles. Hello, Twivers. 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Chapel Hill. I have a pick inspired by Dr. Racaniello's pick from Twiv 2007. Asterisk, not a typo. If no one gets the 2007 reference and you use the pick, I will explain it later. Having Tom Lehrer and Oppenheimer in the same pick and had me going back and listening to a couple of other Tom Lehrer songs. Well, one I listened to last week because of articles is about, about is the U.S. ready for nuclear attack? Here they are. We will all go together when we go. <laughs> and one of my favorites, So Long Mom, a song for World War III. Thanks, Charles. So I, I tried to figure out the 2007. I, I tried binary or I couldn't get it. Anybody know what that means? No. No. Okay. So what is TWIV? Well, we don't have a 2007. That's right. So it was some episode where you had a pick about Oppenheimer and Tom Lehrer. Uh, yes, that was very recently. Yeah. TWIV uh, Lehrer. That's TWIV uh, 1031, Death on the West Nile. Um. <laughs> Death on the West. Nile. Yeah, that was that was that was uh, that was a good title. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how you get from ten thirty one to two thousand seven. Uh, so at at ASV, I 
mistakenly called it 2000. What was ASV? 10, 1019? Let's see. TWIV. Um, Athens. That should get it. Yeah, 1021. I said 2021. My mistake. Remember, Brianne? Then you, you kind of whispered, <laughs> do you mean 1000? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Um, but could that be? So... 1007. Let's look at TWIV 1007. Here we are trying to figure this out in real time. Sorry, folks. <laughs> oh, fragile DNA viruses and cancer. That was, no. that was May. This is like, this would be bad thinking fast and slow. This would be thinking fast. We'll just leave it as a, as a puzzler. How about and then not thinking next at all? week, <laughs> next week. You know, he can uh, send us the answer. But Kathy, I agree. I agree. I just feel that I'm a dummy that I can't figure it out. That's all. But it's, yeah. All right. Nobody can get it. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Uh, that's TWIV 1037. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions, comments, picks, puzzles. <laughs> the twiv at microbe.tv. We would love your support. If you enjoy our work, please support us. It doesn't have to be a lot, but there's so many of you. If so many of you gave so little, it would amount to a good amount. And uh, this is all true. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find out uh, how you can do that. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent, and everybody else. Great show. Welcome back. And, and I hear you're going away again, right? Well, yeah, we have a vacation, another, another trip planned to Iceland, which we just got back from Montana because we were celebrating my wife's 80th birthday. We were supposed to go to Iceland to celebrate my 80th birthday, but then this goddamn little virus picked, you know, this urgent time to emerge, and so they canceled everything for about two years. When are you, so when are you leaving? When are you leaving for Iceland? It's in early September. All right. So we'll see you for a couple more weeks. You will. You will. Well, actually, you we probably will. won't because a lot of the twibs aren't happening, but because I'm traveling. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. The only place I'm going is out to get ice cream with my grandkids. <laughs> Stay warm, Rich. Stay warm. Oh. <laughs> Count on it. Must, it. It must melt very quickly, Rich. Yes, yeah, that's we'll right. Do it in, we'll do it indoors. All right. That's right. Brian Barker is a Drew University bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. I learned Notice a lot. Notice I said Twitter, <laughs> right? Yeah. On, on whatever social media it is at this point. I think if you go to the page, it says X, but I don't like X. I like Twitter. So I can say what I want. People will know forever what I mean, right? Uh -huh. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at Virology. No, you can find me at Microbe TV. I'm not really at Virology.ws anymore. I would like to be, but I'm not. Uh, uh, virology, no, microbe.tv. I would like to thank, <laughs> yeah, habits are hard to break. Like, He's a homeless virologist. <laughs> I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>